Okay, welcome everybody to uh, kind of what I'm calling maybe right now a coffee chat. This is Kevin Jamison with the Dementia Society of America. And I really appreciate that you're joining us today. And I've got a guest, I've got Rachel Wiley with me. So Rachel, welcome. Thank you uh, very great. much for having me. And uh, so Rachel is uh, an advisor to the Dementia Society of America, um, but also runs her own business and uh, has a couple different things going on. So Rachel, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Kevin. Um, like Kevin said, my name is Rachel and I'm an occupational therapist. I am the founder and owner of Day by Day Home Therapy and the Dementia Collaborative. Uh, the majority of what I do is provide day-to-day uh, -day operations, uh, hands-on care to individuals with dementia and their caregivers. Okay, well, that's excellent. And uh, we appreciate you, uh, you joining us today. You're gonna be a valuable asset. Um, so we're here to talk about uh, kind of a top 10 list, you know, maybe in no specific order, uh, but basically I think there's always a challenge when people are away from us, you know, how do we stay in touch? And when people have dementia, it's, it's an issue that goes beyond just normal, pick up the phone and call somebody. There are other things that, that play a role in how to communicate with somebody living with dementia that isn't close to you or that you can't necessarily go see for a variety of reasons, right? There could be, um, there could be health issues in the community where they need to keep people out, such as uh, you know, the flu or, or something like that, or there could be a situation where the person is new to a community and they need to acclimate. And so you need to let them acclimate and then after some period of time, start to interface with them again. So there are a lot of different things going on, but at the end of the day, I've lived it myself. Uh, my wife had dementia and ended up in a care community. And you know, it was, it was heart-wrenching, uh, but at the same time, uh, I ended up knowing that in the end, it was the best decision for her. And uh, it was like a weight was lifted off of her shoulders. Uh, so in many ways, she felt safer, and could uh, have community with other people. Whereas before it was just me in the house, maybe with a full-time care uh, giver as well to join me. Uh, there was uh, any number of issues going on that made it sometimes unsafe and, and not a happy situation for her at home. And that does happen. So when that happens, you know, it, it may mean that somebody needs to be in a care community. And, and again, the care community could be miles away. It could take you an hour's drive to get somewhere or it may be that they're around the corner, but you can't go in for other reasons, health reasons, et cetera. Maybe you're, you're not yourself feeling well, you don't wanna go in and um, you know, transmit or, inf or infect somebody else. So the tips that we're gonna be going through today, and I'll, I'll be putting my glasses on and off because I am over 50, and once you get over 50, you need to put your glasses on. Uh, but uh, so Rachel, that's what we're gonna talk about, and I, and I need you to kind of comment and, and think through with us and share with everybody kind of the top 10, these top 10 lists. And uh, the first one is being tech smart. So, you know, how is it that we can be tech smart if we don't feel comfortable with technology? Uh, so I think there's a couple of basic ground rules. Share with, with us what you think. Absolutely, Kevin. I think that's a, a really common topic that comes up nowadays. Um, the first thing we want to do is consider supplying devices that might not just rely on Wi-Fi. We know that wireless internet can be spotty, um, especially in a lot of these communities. So instead, we want to consider devices such as a cell phone um, or maybe an iPad if that relies on cellular data where we may have a more secure connection. Um, in addition to that, we also want to consider testing the technology that we're going to be using. So uh, you might consider involving a younger adult in your life who maybe has more day-to-day -day experience with this technology, who can work with you to test and retest uh, the technology that you choose to use. So kind of do it beforehand, right? Just to make exactly. sure all the kinks are worked out. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, and then, you know, and, and play kind of like a little bit of a playhouse where you actually have somebody go to another building or another room or another floor as if they can't physically talk to one another and physically be in, the, in close proximity. And that will really kind of prove the system out. Absolutely. And I, I should mention that a lot of iPads or tablets that run on other platforms, because this is not an advertisement for Apple necessarily, 
but you have iOS and you have Android operating systems, most of the major wireless carriers uh, out there will offer you, if the device can do it, they'll offer you a, a chip, a SIM card that you can put in. And basically for just a small additional payment per month, they give you the ability to make that device work on the cellular network. So Absolutely. that's, you know, that's a great suggestion. And, and let's look at our next one. So our next one is reassurance. So, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, there's, there's a need to reassure people uh, that are living with dementia. And, you know, what are your thoughts about that? So reassurance is something that is important regardless of the, the type of communication we're using. Um, but especially if we're using a phone or video method of communication, we wanna make sure that our family member or the person for whom we're caring really feels comfortable and reassured on the other end. And so by that, we mean using phrases like um, everything's okay. Um, you know, it's so beautiful outside today. Anything we can say that's going to really um, lift their spirits, reassure them that they are safe um, and, and uh, well cared for in the environment that they're in. Um, we also want to make sure that we are calm in our expression, um, which I know can be challenging under today's circumstances, but um, thinking about how we can um, manage our, our own uh, feelings and, and comfort level can allow us to reassure our family members to the best of our ability. Oh, good. That, that's excellent. In fact, one of the things that, um, that I've been taught over the years is to actually speak in the kind of to the person themselves, say, you will be okay, or we will be okay. And, and, and that kind of, you know, gives them a very direct feeling that it's personal to them or personal to, to them as a couple or personal to them as a family or friend. And uh, because maybe not everything will be okay for other people. Right. And maybe what they're seeing and hearing doesn't make sense. And, uh, and, and, and so that, you know, we can at least try to reassure them that they will be okay. So you will be okay. We will be okay. Uh, it's a beautiful day for you and us together. Um, so just adding those extra personalizations sometimes might be helpful. Absolutely. And I also think in conjunction with reassurance, we can also consider the idea of acknowledgement. So if we know our family member is afraid or anxious, it's okay to acknowledge and validate that emotion and offer reassurance in combination with that. So if we know they're scared, it's okay to say something like, you're scared, and then say, you are currently safe. Um, or, you know, so-and-so is, is here with you. If you know one of the care providers that is in the room with them or able to, to be in close proximity to them. So I think the acknowledgement um, portion in combination with reassurance can also be very helpful. Right. I agree. Let's take a look, look at another one. So, um, uh, you know, part of it is redirection. Um, you know, how do we, how do we redirect somebody? And, you know, that's, that's a term that, um, you know, kind of some professionals use mm -hmm. when they're talking about folks with dementia in particular. And what, what does redirect mean and how can you use that? And that's a really not, another very good question, Kevin. Redirection really is this idea that we're um, reducing or removing those negatively oriented uh, uh, distractions, which that could be something like, again, the emotion that they're feeling, or it could be a negative environmental component, something like um, maybe a distressing television program or radio program. Um, and so what we want to do is, is redirect by engaging our family member in a different topic or activity. Um, I usually say that, again, acknowledgement and reassurance is really helpful before we attempt redirection because we first want to make sure that they're feeling a little bit more comfortable and then we can try to, um, to redirect their attention into another activity. Um, so we can do that by um, either telling different stories with them, or we can actually use the staff or again, any other care provider who does have direct access to our family member, we can involve them in the conversation as well um, to engage them in another type of activity. 
Okay, well, makes sense, makes sense. So let's take a look at, um, so let's take a look at reminiscence. So, you know, talk about, you know, family stories and family photos and, and other types of objects, actually, that we could use to reminisce. And we could do that remotely. Um, you know, so think about how we would do that remotely. Absolutely. So we know that um, many individuals with dementia may have difficulty with those short-term memories, but longer-term memories may be more intact, um, which is why something like reminiscing can be really effective at um, evoking some of those, those strong uh, positive emotions. Right. So just like you said, Kevin, thinking about how can we tell, um, you know, lighthearted, funny, happy stories from the past, so whether that be um, their childhood, growing up, talking about maybe a pet that they had, their siblings. Um, we can use photographs. We can use music. Um, if there are songs that we know that are very meaningful to them, um, we can use photo albums. So I know that it's a bit more challenging through maybe a video chat, but it's still something that we can, um, you know, attempt to hold up maybe a picture to the video screen. Um, and again, music is something that's going to work uh, no matter what medium we're using. We can always share music together. Uh, we can have our family member listen to a song on one end and we can listen to the song together. We can sing together through the phone or through video. Um, so there are a variety of methods that we could use to um, rem reminisce together regardless of the type of medium we're using for communication. You know, some, that's great. And something that I just saw recently, and it had to do with the fact that somebody couldn't visit their, their wife in a nursing home because of some health issues that were going on between the two of them, that person went to a window outside yeah. and, you know, just kind of sang along with, because you could still be heard, you know, <laughs> through the window. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and it, they weren't able to physically touch, but they touched emotionally. Absolutely. And, and that's it. I've, I've heard stories of some of my clients connecting with their family members, um, even just on the phone and being able to, uh, you know, sing those songs together or um, calling in so that their family member could participate in singing happy birthday to a grandchild. So there are definitely ways that we can maintain important communication throughout um, yes. maybe different health concerns and things like that. Excellent.